The Blair Witch Project was a 1999 horror movie about some film students in the mid-90s heading into some woods to research the legend of the eponymous Blair Witch, and they get lost and tormented and it doesn't end well. Rather than make a game that tried to recreate those events, video game publisher Gathering of Developers set about producing a trilogy of short titles that would take place throughout history at different points in time when earlier events involving the Blair Witch had taken place, some of them alluded to in the film. This was a great idea, expand on the events of the movie and its legends while creating self-contained stories that could experiment and not be tied to the plot of the film directly. Where things get even more interesting, though, is that the developers of the first of these three games, which was set to explore the Blair Witch-related murders committed by Rustin Parr in the 40s, Terminal Reality, had just made a game about a group of paranormal investigators around that time called Nocturne. So instead of Blair Witch Volume 1 Rustin Parr being purely a Blair Witch title, it was made as a sort of crossover between the world that Terminal had made for their original horror game and the events alluded to in Blair Witch about Rustin Parr, in which Nocturne's group of investigators from the government agency Spook House would be the ones to look into the murders and the witch. Now, I'm not sure what came first in this arrangement, whether Terminal were given the Rustin Parr story first and then they realized the timing of Rustin's murders matched when their own characters from Nocturne were active, or if Terminal asked to use the Rustin Parr story so they could have Nocturne's car involved. But either way, it is a pretty crazy and unique rare occurrence for a game studio to get a film license and then just drop their own original cast in there. This is like if in the 2000s you bought Underworld on PS2 and you boot it up and the game just starts with Dante at the DMC like, damn these lichens are getting out of hand recently. Guess I gotta sort them out. If you want to know more about Nocturne, I've got a full video up on the channel about it, and I recommend you watch that too, because I'm not going to be explaining each mechanic that returns for Blair in as much depth here, and I'm also going to be comparing Rustin Parr to Nocturne quite a bit. But in short, Nocturne was about the dual-wielding, mysterious, pinstriped paranormal pain provider, The Stranger, going about the world killing monsters. His methods perhaps aren't best suited to the more delicate art of spirit tracking in rural America, so instead a member of your support team from Nocturne, Elspeth Doc Holliday, responsible for building all of Stranger's gear, is sent in instead to the town of Burkittsville to investigate the Blair Witch. Before that though, unfortunately you have to partake in a very boring and drawn out tutorial segment where you're led through a series of test chambers explaining the basics of movement, combat, and investigating. Considering I had just come off Nocturne when playing this, this felt pretty excruciating. Especially since Nocturne didn't feature such a slow tutorial. But it makes sense that it's here. After all, some of this game's audience may have picked it up because they're fans of the film and are more casual gamers than the kind of crowd likely to purchase an original horror action game like Nocturne. On the bright side, at least it lets you see some more returning Nocturne characters if you bought this game more for its continuation of Nocturne instead. On the whole though, being a game directed at two demographics, Nocturne fans and Blair Witch fans, it's hard to tell what design choices were made to cater to who. Terminal turned down the challenge on this one compared to Nocturne, altering the gameplay mechanics and pacing of Nocturne to produce a much more consistent experience with Blair Witch. Whether this was done to cater to the likely more casual audience of a movie tie-in, or they were just quality changes any Nocturne follow-up would have gotten, is hard to say, but the result I think is definitely positive. One of the biggest problems with Nocturne is that it was hard in bad ways badly implemented platforming and overly punishing fall damage would get the better of you more than enemies, who were by themselves still a serious threat. The frustration at times could get in the way of the interesting world, characters, and scary atmosphere the title was trying to build. In my Nocturne video I suggested that an easier game that relied more on those positive traits would make for a better experience and that's what Blair Witch Rustin Parr effectively is. It takes the gameplay of Nocturne and tones it down to be a little less combat focused, 
takes the awful platforming out and even removes the battery limit from elements like the night vision goggles and it's all better for it. The game's focus on one case rather than four allows it to embellish that one case with much more world building and detail, giving the Rust in Par investigation a lot more texture than the faster paced cases in Nocturne, with far more characters here lending the setting more depth. The game takes place over a series of days. You spend the daytime chatting to the residents of Burkettsville, investigating the town, and when night comes, life-threatening powers emerge to end you, usually in the infamous Blair Witch Woods themselves. It's a really fun little loop, even though this is a short game. You develop familiarity with the small community. Some of its inhabitants are helpful, some less so. You research historic events in the town library and gossip in the local diner. Damn fine cup of coffee. With your main man Dale, this comfy environment is then contrasted really well with the horrors of the night you have to face off with later. I could have easily spent a few more days in Burkittsville getting to know the people and letting the mysteries develop further. This must be where pies go when they die. Some things improved ever so slightly have to be the graphics and visuals. The background here features a lot more detail than Nocturne, the backdrops feel more dense than before. Intricate backdrops here that you may even miss on your first time around. No loitering, please. This is probably due to this being a shorter game, with more repeated areas you return to frequently, but it's worth commending nonetheless. Unfortunately, there's still a lack of polish in the cutscenes. Decapitation is a definitive solution. Characters like in Nocturne have a habit of getting stuck in cutscenes. Unlike Nocturne though, the game works around this if it happens by just teleporting the character to where they're supposed to be if they get stuck, so you don't have to just skip the scene if the cast get caught on something. An improvement, if still inelegant. Talking to people will also frequently give Holiday some pathfinding trouble, as she circles around multiple times before finding the right spot to talk. Did you hear the news? If you can get over these jarring hiccups though, what you get here is honestly a much scarier and unsettling game than Nocturne. The change of focus away from action towards more unsettling environments and well-timed jump scares, combined with tripping not being your number one cause of death, makes this a much less frustrating horror game to get lost in and unsettled by. This isn't saying that action in horror makes for a bad game or an unscary one, of course. Today, a lot of horror games have more in-depth combat that is intrinsically fun to play with during an encounter, regardless of the rest of the game, complementing the experience as a whole, giving the title in question engaging complexities and an extra enthralling edge. Nocturne and Blair Witch don't really have complex and interesting combat systems, so they rely on the pacing and placement of combat encounters and factors more extrinsic to the core combat mechanics to make the overall package compelling, and I think Blair Witch nails that ebb and flow much better than Nocturne. Combat in Nocturne was pretty constant, even during puzzle sections it was hard to avoid being pestered at least a bit, but in Blair Witch there are far more moments of prolonged tension building, a calm before every storm, which like most other horror games with pretty basic fighting, makes the chance of combat and how it factors into the overall flow of the game more engaging than the combat itself, so the lack of complexity in that combat doesn't become as noticeable, and more importantly stops the simple combat from becoming as much of a drag. Not that Blair Witch is a master at this, or a very survival based horror title in general, but it is better at it than Nocturne, we're talking in relative terms here, but the direction is good. If there is something that threatens to throw off the scarier vibe though, funnily enough, it may just be the confidence of our protagonist. Much like The Stranger, Doc Holliday is a stone-cold professional, and unlike protagonists in other horror games, she seems fairly unfazed by it all. Holiday reacts to being caught in an infinite loop in the Blair Witch Woods, with the same distress one might exhibit when late for class your first day at a new school. Here again? Well, now I'm positive I've been walking in circles. Admit it, Elspeth, you are lost. Which makes sense, she works for a paranormal investigation department, she researches this stuff every day. And do you truly believe in such things as witches? I've seen witchcraft, actually performed some myself. Yes, 
I see that. But it takes a bit of the wind out of the villain's sails. The way she talks, I honestly doubt they can beat Holiday. I've heard you've been going into the woods. Uh, yes, I just returned from the Pa residence. Alone? I hope you realize how dangerous that is, especially now. Yes, of course. Why are the children not in school? Again, a demeanor more suited maybe to the more action-heavy Nocturne than the more ambience and puzzle-focused and psychological horror of Blair Witch. Still, leaning on psychological elements more than Nocturne here, I think is pretty cool. Once you enter the Blair Witch woods and navigate its twisting maze, you'll be thrust into various different dimensions that disorientate and play with reality. In these alternate realities, you won't be able to see your position on the map anymore, forcing you to break out a compass or make use of your memory to navigate these parallel worlds. It's neat and manages to get the idea of getting lost in the woods right, which I suppose is the bare minimum thing a Blair Witch game should be achieving. This is one case where fixed static camera angles, throwing you a disorientating angle between camera switches, actually works in the game's favor. If there is one place you should feel lost and disorientated in, it should be the Blair Witch Woods. That said, they only made so much wood here, and some paths seem deliberately fashioned to waste time and drag out the game length. Also, the woods are where the game feels the need to inject the most combat into things, which means there's got to be enemies to kill in a game based on a film where you never see a monster so things do get a little goofy. The best enemies in the game are the Daymites. These guys are creepy, doing their weird flips and shouting in their messed up voices. But the game cops out significantly once we get to the woods. It's regular zombies, zombie dogs, and of course, sentient giant Blair Witch stick figures. The logo comes at you like an enemy. It's the kind of thing you expect to see on the NES or something, where they're just like, what should the enemies be in our Blair Witch game? Or, uh, I don't know, the Blair Witch stick figure? That will do. I know they were strapped for choices, but it's just impossible not to make fun of. Thing is, they're not really as bad as it gets, though. The worst part of the game is this awful, giant ghost scorpion boss fight. The Blair Witch game, everybody. It's an annoying one because it's very hard to tell if you're doing any damage when shooting it. It's got an insta-cool grab, you're in a tight space. It's the one moment of the game where the title jumps from its new more laid-back difficulty back to nocturne levels of action challenge. Here's hoping there aren't any more that size around here. Cat out of the bag, while the Blair Witch is involved in this game, you're going to spend a lot more time dealing with malevolent Native American spirits. It's hard, though, to make a game of this kind off the back of Blair Witch projects without the horror becoming a little more showy or pulpy or whatever. But if you're just here looking for more Nocturne, you'll probably be fine with that. The final set piece will be especially enjoyable if you're looking for one last hurrah for that game's universe and cast. It should be unsurprising that a Blair Witch game made in 2000 is going to lean on gamey elements such as gunplay and monster hunting that don't necessarily gel with the hopelessness and non-specificity of the narrative of the film it's based on. And does it get more gamey than cheats and easter eggs? which this game gleefully throws in as well for those looking to maximize their playtime. The Blair Witch. Game everybody. Man, Cooper just does not give a shit. What can I say? Man likes his coffee. This is honestly very funny. Video game models have come so far now. The idea that at this level of detail, any game would try to titillate is hilarious in retrospect. This isn't the only raunchy Easter egg either. I'll leave it up to you to find the other one. If you're looking for something a little more substantial than cheats and Easter eggs to extend this four hour game's length, and you didn't already pick it on your first playthrough, I suppose, there's hard puzzle mode, which is actually pretty cool. It adds new puzzles, extends certain scenes. Stranger, you know I hate it when you smoke in here. Hmm. Must have slipped my mind. I'll bet. I thought you quit smoking. You should give it a try, Doc. Might help you relax. 
and fleshes out different events with new solutions to previously simple problems. There's a part where you need to get a map from a deputy, but he won't talk openly with you when the grumpy sheriff is around. On normal, if you go to the diner, the sheriff will show up and you can use his absence at the police station to go talk to the deputy. On hard puzzle mode, when you do that, he'll barge in just before the deputy can talk. Listen, you sneaky broad. I knew as soon as you left the diner, you were up to no good. And so instead, you have to go visit the newspaper office where you can get a report of weird symbols that were drawn on the school. You can buy paint from the town shop and paint those symbols on the school yourself to distract the sheriff with them, so as to talk to the deputy, which works. Only if you do that, that, the sheriff will arrest you because he checked with the store and knows you bought the paint. You think I'm some kind of idiot? Old man Cole over at the general store says he only sold one bucket of red paint in the past month, and that was to you. And it's game over. There's optional cutscenes and fail states on normal, but it's cool to see that even hard has new added segments with incorrect solutions that can end your game. And this game over makes sense. Of course, he'd check the store to find out if anybody had just bought paint. This all sounds like awesome stuff that should elevate this game. The problem is I then ran into an issue where I couldn't find what the right way to distract the sheriff on hard puzzle mode was. It seems like the game wanted me to take some chalk from the school to create the symbols instead of the paint, but Holiday wouldn't take them while the school teacher was watching. I can't take the chalk while she's watching. I ended up looking at a walkthrough that said the school teacher should be asleep at the point I was at in the story, but she just wasn't. She's asleep before, but you can't take the chalk at that time. I just didn't know how to get this chalk. I had to load a way earlier save and work my way back there. And somehow the woman was asleep at the right point in the game that time. I don't know if I triggered some kind of glitch or there was a tiny nonsensical step I skipped or an order in which I had to talk to people I didn't follow. But no matter what the reason, this kind of situation is just not good. This kind of moment is representative of the larger problem with this game in general. You can call something like Blair Witch, Rustin Parr, a hidden little gem until you're blue in the face, but in general, most people aren't gonna look past game stoppers like the chalk issue, or all the goofy cutscene mishaps, or weird animation hiccups, and call the game a sick horror title, no matter how charming the game is in other aspects. And of course, it is charming, but just another example though of how Terminal Reality had plenty of fun, creative horror chops, but not the time and resources required to polish their work up at the time, so as to become the sort of material that would catch on as classic in the mind of gamers, like other more refined horror games of the time managed. I've seen footage elsewhere of people playing Blair Witch where stuff like the cloth physics weren't going so crazy, so at least that may vary depending on what modern hardware you're using to play. I haven't played much of the other two Blair Witch games released by the gathering of developers. They take place further back in time, aren't made by Terminal Reality, and don't feature the Nocturne cast, so they're a different kind of beast for certain that we should discuss at another time. Anyway, if you enjoyed Nocturne, this is basically required play, I think, and it's not a terrible piece of old school horror gaming by itself. It's got mood, it's got genuinely spooky moments and fun secrets to uncover. And again, like Nocturne, I'm pretty sure it's freeware, so there's nothing but time to be lost here. Also, don't turn this 3D card setting on, it did nothing but make my game unplayable. With this on, the game ran like crap and doors would be hesitant to open. I also had to run it on Windows 98 compatibility mode for it to load properly, so keep that in mind. I've left a few surprises out of this video, so don't think you've seen all this game has to offer just yet, there's plenty more to see. The only other official Nocturne game being about Blair Witch is extremely weird. The fact that these are the only two games about Spook House. But it does get me thinking how cool it could have been if Terminal had been able to have Spook House investigate more famous horror events in media. They could have been a full-on corny crossover squad throughout multiple games. Now that would have been crazy. Video games' very own monster detective agency existing to scope out and destroy famous villains. I don't know, wishful thinking at this point. 
It's a shame there's no more Nocturne outside of the unofficial nods in Blood Rain. I feel like if Nocturne continued, it could have become a real iconic member of video gaming's horror catalog. There's already refinements present in Blair Witch. Imagine where it could have gone from here. Anyway, since Spookhouse's legacy stopped here with this game, I hope these videos shed a bit of light over these titles where a lack of follow-ups failed to. Peace. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I would highly appreciate your backing on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash thegamingbritshow or click the icon on screen if you're interested in helping out. A big thanks goes out to my top backers who you're seeing right now. Have a good one.